Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here for a webinar that will detail lessons learned from construction of a red oak rain garden. This rain garden is a 10,000 square foot landscape installation at the University of Illinois campus uh, that soaks up rainwater and supports pollinators. Uh, we will focus on the experience of designing and building the garden and lessons that we can apply to our own projects. This is a free webinar and one PDH professional development hour will be available. We have several of these workshops throughout the year. These workshops are part of our public outreach and education programs and help us meet requirements outlined in our ILR 40 permit with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program. Uh, we are encouraging government staff, including stormwater, public works, and transportation staff, and any contractors out there to attend or view this webinar. Again, one PDH will be available for your participation. Uh, if you have other staff that could not attend uh, this afternoon, this webinar is being recorded and the presentations will be made available uh, for viewing at their convenience. And we will email that link with this information shortly following the program. All right, just a couple quick thank yous. Uh, thank you to Mary Mitros. She's our uh, stormwater communications supervisor and she helped uh, set up the webinar today. Uh, thanks to Mary Beth Falsey. She is our water quality supervisor and she is behind the scenes running the program. Uh, also, thank you to the Conservation Foundation. Uh, they are our partners for all of these workshops, especially Jan Rail. Uh, she's the DuPage County Program Director for the Foundation and she helped line up our speaker for this afternoon. And once again, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, just a quick public service announcement. The DuPage County Health Department is requesting that everyone remember the three W's in order to stay safe during these times. Uh, wear a mask in public, watch your distance, uh, stay six feet apart, and of course, wash your hands frequently. Uh, just a couple other quick notes. Uh, I am very happy that spring is finally upon us. I'm sure most of you are also thrilled following that long COVID winter that we just had. Uh, but spring is a very exciting time. In fact, I, I have a question for the group. How excited was the gardener about spring? So excited that he wet his plants. He wet his plants. All right, well, anyway, uh, we have a great speaker and presentation for you this afternoon. We have Eliana Brown from the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and she is with us to share her experiences regarding the design and construction of the Red Oak Rain Garden at the U of I. Uh, before I turn things over to her though, I want to remind everybody that uh, we do have this chat feature. Uh, everyone is muted, but if you do have questions or comments during the presentation, please type them directly into the chat box and we will relay those on to Eliana at the end of her presentation and we'll get to as many of those as uh, time will allow. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Eliana Brown. Uh, again, she's a water quality specialist with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and the Illinois Extension. Uh, her areas of expertise include green infrastructure and stormwater. She leads Illinois Extension's role facilitating the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy and is a National Green Infrastructure Certified Program Instructor at Parkland College. Her education includes a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering and she is a certified master gardener. Uh, so with that, uh, let's turn it over to Eliana. Um, Eliana, welcome, thank you for being here. And uh, you can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Uh, great, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Mary Beth, Claire, and Jan for uh, asking me to speak uh, today. So, um, as Chris said, I'm talking about the Red Oak Rain Garden on the University of Illinois campus. And these are some of our lessons learned from um, building our project. So I do want to first acknowledge my team. I have a great team that I've worked with on this project, and um, they are listed here. Um, just want to point out our communications manager, Kate Gardner, our landscape designer, Lane Kenoki, and our project engineer, Tony Heath, and one of our wonderful community volunteers, Karen Folk. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and then we're going to dive right into those lessons 
design and engagement, I wanted to kind of split them up in those, from those two categories. Uh, so with engagement, you can also think of outreach. And then lastly, I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, additional training and resources to uh, leave you with today. So uh, I'm assuming most people that are on this webinar do know what a rain garden is, but I'm just going to go ahead and define it here so that we're all on the same page. It has that shallow basin that's capturing and infiltrating uh, stormwater runoff, snow melt, helps mitigate flooding and improve water quality and supports pollinators and human well-being. Chris gave the definition really nicely already of what the Red Oak Rain Garden is, but it is a 10,000 square foot demonstration site on the campus of the University of Illinois that captures stormwater, reduces sidewalk flooding, and provides wildlife habitat. It does also educate our campus and community about sustainable landscape design, and we call it an example of a living learning laboratory on our campus that enhances the, the student experience. So this is uh, where it is located and um, to kind of orient us here, of course, this is north, but we have a couple of residence halls that are our neighbors. We are also neighbors to our um, medical facility. So this is the parking lot for the medical facility. And then this is where the rain garden is located. This guy right here actually is our red oak and this is a sycamore. So it's in this, uh, we extend a little bit further out in a sunny portion and then under these two trees. So um, the build that we did in 2019 was actually a rebuild. The original garden was built in 2006. This is the original plan for it. And here's a couple of very hardworking students. It was built as part of Professor Tony Endress's Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences class. And you can see they are shoveling a whole bunch of stone into a wheelbarrow. We'll circle back to that. But this is a photo of what the garden looked like in the fall of 2006. It was a very stone-centered design. The shrubs were pretty small then. We have a couple of sculptures that were added after that. but. Um, um, this is a pretty good representation of what things look like in the beginning. Uh, but this is the the uh, this is why we needed to do a renovation. This is what things look like in in uh, 2019 before our renovation. So all of that stone that um, that you saw in the previous photo is still underneath here. But this, these are weeds that are covering it. Um, I didn't tell you how much stone was in there. Sometimes I have people guess, but um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna tell you the answer. It was 60 ton, 60 ton of stone went in through here. So it's a lot, it was a very, very stone centered design, a lot of stone. Our shrubs had not really received very much maintenance back um, well, by in, in 2019. And things just look very overgrown. Is this is a main thoroughfare walking into campus, and um, this is what would be greeting a person, and that's just not very welcoming. This is our after. So um, this is summer of 2020. Uh, some of our little our little guardrails are are still up, but um, I show this slide to really underline that we've gone from a very stone centered design to a very plant centered design. So now we're going to delve into the lessons learned. Lesson one is choosing your site carefully. So kind of uh, rolling the time machine back again, this is what things look like before the original garden was built in the spring of uh, 2006. You can see that um, on that thoroughfare that people would be walking into campus, they would be greeted by a big puddle, and that's not very nice. That sidewalk intersection was over here, just to orient you a little bit. But here is the one of the, the big main problems is that we would have, you would then see uh, all of this water that is pulled next to this red oak. Um, I am not a tree expert, but the tree experts tell me that red oaks do not like having wet feet. And so this was not a very good situation for this tree. So one of the, the main um, aims of the original build was to pull that water away from that tree and direct it to um, closer to the sycamore tree, which does like having wet feet. 
I'm going to back up one slide and say one thing about this more, though. Um, as we uh, in Extension teach people, teach homeowners how to build rain gardens, uh, one of the things that we teach them now that um, the team was not really aware of back in 2006 was that a, a pool, an area with pooled water may not be the best place for uh, a homeowner DIY rain garden. And the reason for that is that you might expect that the soils underneath here are either compacted or have too much clay. And that's one of the reasons why you're getting the standing water. Uh, and so there may have to be other uh, additional engineering aspects that have to be done for a site like this to be okay. And that is, those are some of the things that, uh, that were done as part of this project, but I don't want to, um, I wouldn't feel right to not mention that. So when choosing your site carefully, you either would want to have a site that doesn't have pooling or, uh, or you would need to know those extra bits of information so that the project will um, drain when it's supposed to. The lesson number two of this is uh, to consider foot traffic. So um, this is a picture from 2009 in the original, the original garden. And here's that design plan just to kind of orient us a little bit. This is another, uh, another sidewalk that's coming into the garden. And the way that the Path of Desire works is that um, a person walking here would really just want to go right through that garden, which adds to that compaction that I was just talking about. And in this photo here, you can see where uh, even though you have some big shrubs, this was this was just very it was very compelling for uh, students, um, any any pedestrians really walking past here to to that they would want to go through here. And here's a whole bunch of them coming that way. Uh, and it's 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 from both directions. I uh, prior to our build, as we were doing our redesign, uh, walk this area quite a bit. And and if I were a student or if I had not been attached to this project, I would probably want to walk through it too. So it's not I don't want to blame it on the students, but it's a it's 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 a design issue. So there's also, uh, ah, yes, this slide, um, that path of desire is so strong that even in winter, even in winter with uh, a foot of snow or half foot of snow and all that slush that a person would want to be walking through, this is how we really knew that, um, that it was a problem. So this is the other side of the garden. This is that red oak. There was a big berm around the, gar around the garden uh, that also had become a big path of desire. So um, in really analyzing this and looking at the redesign that we did, the designers in conjunction with working with uh, the University Facilities and Services uh, decided that we could have a sidewalk that would be installed here. And then that path through the garden was going to have a bridge. So the sidewalk on the side here is already installed. And uh, I'm out here um, often. And it is very well utilized. The bridge was scheduled to be built in uh, 2020, but the pandemic uh, delayed it for about a year. And we are uh, just had our pre-construction meeting. So we're expecting to build it at the end of May, but this is a rendering of, um, these are footings, but this is a rendering of what it will look like. Just a, a, a note about this bridge is that um, it is a, um, the design is actually, the um, Forest Service typical design that would be used in a natural area. Um, but we worked with a structural engineering professor, Professor Bill Campbell, in order to modify that design for a sustainably sourced wood that we have partnered with um, Allerton Park, University of Illinois Allerton Park, that cull those trees to make way for more native trees. So that is part of. Um, our process of building that bridge. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on, um, on this section, designing with maintenance in mind. Um, Many of you, if you've worked on green infrastructure and rain gardens, you're probably well aware that one of the biggest concerns with rain gardens is the maintenance. And um, my team and I fully believe that um, the maintenance begins with the design. 
So um, in utilizing our example from 2006, this is that stone center design that was the original design. And then this is how things looked 11 years later. And we can see you know, the, the weeds and the fouling. Um, and we think, um, we think that the, the stone was selected back at this time um, when a lot of rain garden prototypes were coming from the Northwest where stone might be more, uh, a, more of an appropriate material. But in the Midwest, uh, I am pretty convinced that it's not a great um, material for us, especially under two trees, and especially if one of those trees is a sycamore. This beautiful tree um, that's really hidden by this scraggly looking scrub, um, shrub here, this beautiful tree, um, it drops a lot of leaves and twigs and um, makes, made, just did not set the garden up for success for being well maintained. And so, yeah, we, decided that stone was not going to be the way forward for us. We did, in renovating, we did have to do a lot of demolition. We had to use these very large pieces of equipment to get all of the stone out of there. And um, there was landscape fabric under the stone. So um, I'm also not a very big fan of landscape fabric. In the finished garden now, the renovated garden, we do have very limited amount of large stone that does have landscape fabric underneath it, but that's only in our areas where we would have point flow coming in to prevent erosion. And I'll point that out in a subsequent slide. So uh, instead with that, in addition to the plant-centered design, we did in our sunny cell, we did also um, add engineered soil. We really wanted to make sure that we would have excellent infiltration for a very long time. And so um, we over excavated about two feet and added the engineered soil in. We were only able to do that in that sunny portion and we're not able to do it under the uh, tree section. Uh, we did not want to impact the tree roots. But what we did do is add an application of mycorrhizal inoculant over the entire garden. Uh, that was a suggestion of Jack Pizzo, who uh, is a U of I alum, and uh, he served as an advisor onto the garden. And I think that it was a really excellent suggestion. It, um, we are having really great infiltration rates and uh, it's hard to say for sure if the mycorrhizal inoculant is 100% responsible for that, but um, knowing what we know from um, the USDA soil, ex soil health experts, we know that that really gives it an excellent boost. Um, so we're, we're really grateful for that suggestion. And this is a picture of that same cell in this past year's summer. So I wanted to point out, I mentioned that the very limited places where we do have rock, this is one place where the water comes in. And I'll speak briefly here about the water flow through the garden. So uh, there's my mouse again. Okay, so the water comes in here, obviously, and then it fills up this cell. There is a pipe that's underneath this, this sidewalk that takes it to the sycamore cell. And then on um, further in back to where this, where the red oak is. Not very, it's not shown very well in this photo, but um, the way that the profile engineering was done on the garden, there is an overflow that would exit into this parking lot where there is a storm drain. So that serves as the um, outfall. I also had mentioned the two sculptures. It's not really a design lesson other than if you get, if you have the opportunity to have some really talented uh, art students, uh, you, you hold a contest. This was done back in 2006 and the, the sculpture um, was selected from uh, a number of students and um, she did this really great sculpture that's called Prairie Fire. And um, her name is Jennifer Astwood, and she has gone on to become faculty of, at the University of Wisconsin. So 
showing here, and you can see it here, the, um, I want to talk a little bit more on the planting design and how that was designed with maintenance in mind. So that was greatly inspired by this book called Planting in a Post Wild World by Thomas Rayner and Claudia West. It is hands down uh, the best book I have ever read um, that teaches you how to design with native plants. We'll also say that both Thomas Rayner and Claudia West are excellent speakers. And if you ever get a chance to see either one of them, say yes. So the basis of this is that you have these layers. And the first one is a ground cover layer. Um, the ground cover layer that's shown here, it looks, looks like sedges, but they can be other plants. Uh, there's other kinds of plants besides sedges, but the whole idea that we wanna get across with this image is that you are doing a full cover of the, of, of the soil. So in the first couple of years, there's a little bit of mulch that you would add as the plants grow in together. And though you will see some slides where you can see that, but the idea is that within three years, you'd want to have this full bed because that outcompetes weeds and that's really going to give you a leg up on maintenance. So in terms of the percentage of a garden that you would have in ground cover, the 60 to 70%, they're generally shortest and they should be very densely planted. Here's that beautiful sycamore tree, uh, freshly planted. We did plant in a grid and this is where we expect to see um, this fill in more as the garden ages a little bit. But already this section here has filled in really very nicely. These are some of the species that we have included in the Red Oak Rain Garden. And at the end, I can include a link uh, to uh, our plant list that's on our website, and that link will be provided too. Here's just a few uh, examples of what some of them look like up close. This is Pennsylvania sedge, pretty, um, uh, uh, I maybe call it a ubiquitous sedge. It's, it's of native sedges. I think this is one that uh, at least where I am in central Illinois, it's, you're more often, you're more likely to find this one. Um, there are that's something like four, I don't know, I was gonna say 400. I think there may even be more than that, ki different kinds of sedges, but um, this is a, a really good example of a nice sedge for ground cover, but it doesn't have to just be the grass-like appearance. Jacob's Ladder has these gorgeous little flowers and you can have some interest in that way and it has this different kind of foliage. So um, that provides nice contrast with the sedges. And then in our sunny cell, you can enjoy something as glorious as this. Purple poppy mallow is, oh, this is the first year of purple poppy mallow. And wow, um, it's just a showstopper uh, as even um, in the 2020 with the first year of being out in the garden in the limited way that we were allowed to be so as people would walk by, they would, they always ask what plant this is. Prairie alum root is another one that just want to mention. Um, many gardeners may know it as hookera. It's, it is the native species of uh, hookera that is, um, can be a lot of different kinds of hookeras, but we want to give a big shout out to our native species because uh, it's straight species because it's so beautiful as a ground cover and it's just even more gorgeous in the fall. And moving on to the structural layer, these are the backbone of the garden, which has taller plants, includes shrubs, and you generally need just much fewer of them to make an impact. There's the list of them, which I, again, will be, um, you can find on our website. Here's a good example of it with rosin weed. This one is a, a very tall plant. Um, and we're using it really sparingly. Uh, the landscape designer, Lane Kanuki, when he gives this portion of the presentation, he likes to say how, uh, likes to point out how with um, these two, it's, it's, um, it's just the perfect amount. And if you had 40 of them, it would get lost and it wouldn't read quite as well. This, this is the number that you need. We also like to point out that it uh, is a good, good um, attractor of uh, bees and other pollinators. 
Red chokeberry is, um, boy, one of, I think, our breakout stars of the Red Oak Rain Garden. This shrub is gorgeous in all seasons. So this is here, it is in spring. This is what it looks like in the summer. And then in the fall, it really starts going um, with its gorgeous red. And then Lane calls this fall 2.0. Its leaves come off and then its berries are just there, which look fantastic in the first snowfall. And then in the very, very, very late winter, you're just, you're, you're super rewarded by this plant because it attracts all of these sweet robins that come and, and pluck off all of the berries and get it ready for the upcoming spring. The last layer uh, of the original three that Rainer and Wes talk about is the seasonal layer. So our seasonal layer is um, ones that uh, would be easily identified by uh, be, by being the kind of iconic species of say like what a typical prairie would look like. So um, these are the ones that um, before I was trained as a master gardener and was just starting to get interested in gardening several years ago, I'd go to a native plant sale and I'd buy all of these because they're so showy and they're so amazing. And I look over those ground covers and that is not the way to do it. The way to do it is to really think very carefully about uh, where a seasonal layer would fit in with those other two layers and be chosen for the um, to have continual blooming throughout the garden season. There's our list. Here's a really great example of this gorgeous, gorgeous black-eyed Susan. Um, royal catchfly is actually an endangered plant, so we're really happy to be hosting this plant. And then finally, um, the yellow coneflower is a, a very iconic looking species that, again, this is, I mean, you think about a prairie, this and uh, there are our next couple of ones, the purple coneflower, everybody knows purple coneflower, right? I always like to point out our insects. And then our stunning butterfly weed. So the um, you know University of Illinois campus, we have to have our big bursts of orange, but it just opposes really great with that purple poppy mallow that's kind of out of focus here, right? As um, in this photo, these are, these are um, colors that go well together and serve each other well. So they not only serve each other well in that the purple poppy mallow is a ground cover and the butterfly weed is seasonal, but they're working well uh, on this different level with colors as well. All right, so those were the three official layers from the planting in a post wild world. Um, there is also this uh, ephemeral layer that uh, Lane is, is um, introducing as its own layer in the garden. Um, and it's the one that's really alive right now. Ephemerals are, uh, I love ephemerals. They're just really great. They are, um, they're so interesting. I mean, they are truly ephemeral. They do disappear over the summer months. And so they do need to be intermixed with those ground covers so that once they have done their show, there's something that's, uh, that's underneath them that will still be covering that soil so that the weeds can't go in and do their thing. The bluebells. We just started having our very first blooms of bluebells this year. We installed them as a secondary planting last fall and, uh, and they're just doing their thing right now. Um, you're further north than we are, so I'm imagining that your bluebells will probably come on in about a week or two, but they're one of our favorite plants. And here's another uh, really sweet little, uh, little ephemeral. All right. Let me check my time here, see how I'm doing. Okay, yes, I think we're okay. I'm gonna talk a little about the engagement lessons. So we're Illinois Extension and we need to make sure that we are educating the public about these good sustainable gardening practices. And so these are some of our lessons that we have learned in incorporating that into um, building green infrastructure. 
first one is engaging stakeholder partners. So uh, way back now, I think when this project started 2014, 2015, when we were first started to figure out how, what, how we were going to do this, maybe 2016-ish, we held two stakeholder input sessions that were facilitated so that the campus um, stakeholder uh, individuals that um, that either worked on the campus as faculty or academic professionals, or if you were a student. And we also invited the master gardeners and master naturalists and people that lived in the neighborhoods nearby. And so these were, this was the result of our um, of our meetings and they still serve as a guidepost of how we uh, make decisions for the garden. These are partnerships that we had with uh, some um, incredible nurseries and our local extension office uh, and other and funders as well. So I'll just point out a few of them. Um, Piso, I'd already mentioned, and then also a possibility place. Arbor Smith is, uh, gave us some great, great um, help with that red oak. We did have to excavate a little bit near the red oak, and so they worked with us and our um, ed extension horticulture educator to make a map of the tree roots, which was really great and extremely helpful so that we did not hurt that tree. Um, and I'll just ask you all to, you could go to our website slash donors to take a look at some of the other folks that we worked with. Um, we did also um, incorporate uh, a number of departments at the university, which is uh, a really great benefit that we have. So I had really never heard this, this phrase before, service learning. It has since become one of my favorite phrases ever. Uh, so inviting service learning to get, this is a 10,000 square foot rain garden, as we've mentioned a couple of times. So there were, there's a little more than 9,000 plants in it. And that's a lot of plants that needed to be planted. Uh, so we, um, worked with a number of different classes at the University of Illinois landscape architecture and horticulture. Here are some of the horticulture students and we provided training for these volunteers so that they would know what to do and they would have a little background as to what we were doing. Uh, some of these students, this is a this is a horticulture 100 class, so um, some of these students had actually never planted a plant before, so we taught them how to do that. Uh, this is um, Professor Bridget Moan and a couple of her landscape architecture students also getting a little bit of training. And we had community volunteers. Here's Karen again, one of our, um, our lead master naturalist. Uh, there's a few other master naturalists that um, are holding, actually these, they are, um, um, they are holding our plans as they are putting things in. We gave uh, the leaders of um, of our volunteer groups the plans and help had you utilize them to help us to get everything all set up. So one of the really cool things about uh, service learning is that everybody, uh, uh, the volunteers are learning. We are honing our outreach skills and. We also have this opportunity for intergenerational learning, which I just think is really cool. I don't think it happens very much anymore. So here's a typical um, student uh, around, you know, 20 years old, college age, uh, with a master gardener who retiree, working side by side. Uh, the big lesson that we got in having uh, a lot of different generations especially the baby boomers and the millennials in one place, right? They're not supposed to like each other, I guess. I don't know, we didn't find that at all. Everybody liked each other quite a bit. Our secret to that was that we played the uh, Spotify playlist of the uh, soundtrack to the Guardians of the Galaxy um, movie. And that movie, all of the songs are from the 70s. So the boomers knew it from first time around and all the millennials and Gen Zers love that movie. So that's, uh, that, that may be the best takeaway from this whole presentation. Here we have a lot, a lot of students. So the reason I'm showing this photo is that we have lots and lots and lots of people. 
and in uh, a number of the um, relationships that we built as part of this, it came in very helpful with uh, our planting grid and with drilling our planting grid. So here's my staff member, landscape designer, Lane Kenoki, drilling. He probably still drilled about 70% uh, of every one of those holes. But with all of those students coming in, he had, he, Lane had come in and probably, um, he came in like on a Sunday and drilled as many holes as he could, which was quite a bit because the students were coming in Monday morning. And then within 15 minutes, they had planted all the plants. And so we realized that this was going to be a race between drilling enough holes and students coming in because we wanted, you know, we had arranged them to come in and when part of this part of service learning, we needed to give them things to do. So we started with our relationships, bringing in uh, reserves of, um, of drillers. So this was a, a, a augmented team of drillers. And then we even had one more. This is a, uh, a retired uh, botanist from our survey, Bill Handel, who this is even his own drill, came in in a pinch when we, we really, really needed it. Last engagement lesson, have fun and celebrate success. A lot of the work that we do as environmental professionals uh, can, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can be improved in the environment. I'm sure I'm not telling anyone anything. And so sometimes we have to remind each other to have fun with things. Uh, and that brings more people in. So we actually, this is uh, Lane and a couple of students and, and me, maybe with a little injury, uh, right after our planting, this is us just really like almost throwing our hats in the air and celebrating our, the very, very last plug. But then, um, although the, the bridge isn't in yet, and this is in the fall of 2019, we decided that it was a good idea to have a soft opening. And uh, a couple of all right, historian that uh, works at the university let us know that the two trees were, they, they dated them back to 100 years ago. So we decided to have, throw a tree birthday party. And uh, this is us having a little fun, this is the team. And then we invited uh, a number of faculty and uh, staff members from Extension and people from the neighborhood. We gave some talks, we had some tours and uh, it's a birthday party, so we had cake. I wanna point out the really great thing about these two different kinds of cakes is that the bakery that we work with, Berries and Flour is amazing. And uh, she took, um, acorns that we had gathered from that red oak and made it into acorn flour that was used for one of the cakes. And then the other cake utilized spice bush and aronia, which are two of the different shrubs that are in the garden. So the fun has kind of continued in 2020. This was um, some of the social media that we put out with uh, the, the caterpillars. We saw, we saw a ton of caterpillars even for our first year. And so we thought it was pretty hilarious to think about them all, all of them in a Zoom meeting, right? And I don't know if you can see some of the names on here, but there's like Monarch J Fox and um, Sinead O Cocooner, uh, yeah. We, you can laugh, you can, you know, be laughing, laughing, laughing to yourselves. We got a big kick out of it. Our student team, uh, we had a student team for the first time in 2020, and they do have done some amazing things with our social media. They also are utilizing science. So we try to combine uh, science and uh, lighthearted social media. So this is um, the team doing some infiltration testing. Uh, we have created a socially distant scavenger hunt for uh, the students that live in the residence hall nearby. Combining that science and thinking of some monitoring, just want to point out that we have a Coco Ross rain gauge station at the garden. And then um, this is our bloom calendar from 2020. So we are taking meticulous notes on when our blooms start and stop to make sure that we have that continual blooming that we're talking about. And there's two good reasons for that. One of them is, is that everybody likes to see blooms in a beautiful garden. Humans really like that as a human, as a human myself, I respond really well when I see something beautiful and uh, respond to color, but it's not only us, right? It's the pollinators. So these are all plants that, um, that help out our pollinators and help out wildlife and we wanted to make sure that we had a good strong continuous foraging season for them. 
Uh, so I think I have mentioned what's not on here is the bluebells. They are actually blooming right now, uh, and they were put in at the fall of 2020. So they'll go right there to extend that season even further. And we took, we just finished this out, but you can, that link will still work for our blog that talks about our uh, contest that we held. Um, like March Madness, right? This is mulch madness. And we uh, paired native plant against native plant to duke it out to see who was going to win. And um, this year, this year it was bluebells. It was newcomer bluebells. Last year it beat out butterfly weed, which was first seed. So this is just the uh, little um, recap of the things that we talked about choosing your site carefully, considering foot traffic, designing with maintenance in mind, with uh, engaging volunteers, stakeholder partners, inviting service learning, and making sure that you're still having fun and celebrating successes. I'm going to end things up talking uh, to provide a few resources for you. Uh, so, these are some brochures that um, our team produces. We kind of think of it as um, taking the lessons of the Red Oak Rain Garden home. Um, the one for this on the left is just a few selected Illinois native plants and it lists out their attributes, where they want to be and what kinds of pollinators they might be helping. The one in the middle is this full sun pollinator garden and then here's a full sun ring garden. This is a series that is being continued on with a lot more brochures, so there's more to come where you can find them all at this website. Uh, this is the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website and um, pointing you towards resources and the, the publications that are listed here. And if you um, search, uh, uh, there's a box called Our Team and search for my name, you can find all of these and I can put this in the chat afterwards. But I want to focus on this one on the right, the Full Sun Rain Garden. So this is what's in the in the inside of the brochure. Uh, this is a planting plan that the landscape designer Lynn Kanoki made, and it incorporates all of those designing with maintenance in mind lessons that I just talked about. And it also gives a really nice recap of the plants that are in here, what they like, and um, the kind of um, bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds that they support. Uh, include these pictures of uh, what the garden would look like in four seasons in order to remind everyone to be thinking about that. And then in the back, there are some other kinds of um, information as to where, uh, what portion of a rain garden, whether you would be in the basin, the slope, or the bank, or the particular plants would want to be. So that's a third dimension of design, of course, that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. We have a new brochure that we just released that focuses on those ephemerals, and these are some of the ephemerals that are in there. Uh, again, that can be found at that Illinois Indiana Sea Grant Resources website. Uh, and I'll put in a plug for a, a series that I did um, about two years ago called Stormwater at Home. There's the Go Illinois link at the bottom here that will take you to a whole playlist of uh, topics, uh, including rain gardens, but beyond rain gardens. These are residential scale stormwater green infrastructure practices. Um, so I invite you to go check those out. And we've come to the end of my slides. Uh, here is the uh, website for the Red Oak Rain Garden, redoakraingarden.org. I invite you to follow us on all the social media platforms at Rain Garden UIUC. Um, because I mentioned that we have students helping us. We're even on TikTok. I've never been on TikTok, but we're on TikTok. So it's where uh, we, we, we need to reach a, uh, and engage our young population. And that helps us with that. This is my contact information if you have any questions that are beyond what we do in the chat. But most of all, I really want to thank you all for your time and your attention today and to learn about the Red Oak Rain Garden. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Eliana. That was very impressive. I was, I didn't know, how, you know, I saw that you, your 
presentation had about 109 <laughs> slides and you went through them very well. So um, great you job. All, you all were scared, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Hey, well, 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 great job. We do have a couple questions that came in, uh, but, but uh, for the audience, please use that chat box if you do have any other any more questions. Uh, but we do have a couple here that I'm going to read to you, Eliana. Uh, so it, it says, "Does water? Oops, let me. Uh, does water enter the sunny cell of the rain garden through a pipe, or is it primarily surface sheet flow?" It's a great question. It's. Um... So I'm gonna, that's option A, that's option B, it's actually option C. It enters uh, through, I'll put that picture back up. It's through the surface, it's it's through surface point flow. <laughs> it's not really, I wouldn't call it sheet flow. So uh, let me do it a little differently than that. Whoops. Um, okay, hold on a second. Um, yeah, that, that may be the answer. So it's coming in. There's a sidewalk that runs alongside the garden, and a lot of the water is coming through there. So it's kind of coming in as at a point. Originally, we didn't have that rock. Let me try this again, maybe. Yeah, there I got it that time. Okay. We didn't have that rock put in. Um, there we go. That's the one I want. We didn't have that rock put in here. And so we were starting to see some erosion here, which indicated to us that, yeah, that is really, uh, that is really point flow. So we added it there. Okay. Um, uh, here's another question that came in. Um, what are the maintenance requirements for this garden and how will it be maintained to avoid the mistakes of the first version? That's a wonderful question, a great question. And in fact, a question that um, kept me up at nights when I was asked to re-engage um, re with this project, because I did not want to do this work unless we had a really good maintenance plan. So a um, couple, couple of ways of answering that. The first is that we have a written maintenance document that covers the the infrastructure needs and the plant needs. So it's it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, and we keep adding to it. It's adaptive. We utilize a lot of adaptive management with this garden. As we learn more things, we change things. But the structure of um, of having people to do it was the, the component that that I needed. Um, and in fact, I, I thought for a while that there was going to be no way of uh, reinvigorating this garden as um, the grounds department at the University of Illinois. Um, they do an amazing job taking care of an incredible amount of acres on our campus, but they, they don't have the time and money to focus on a uh, one place like this. Um, I, there is a place on campus called the Japan House, which has a incredible garden, an incredible tea garden. Um, and I learned that um, the way that that was being maintained on campus was through the Master Gardener program. Um, there was one person, the designer, uh, Jim Byers, his name is amazing guy. And um, he still would lead the Master Gardeners in taking care of it and was teaching them how to do it so they could succeed him. So when I learned that that was a structure that could happen, um, and at that time I had um, become a Master Gardener, I approached the idea of being able to have the Red Oak Rain Garden be an, um, an official approved garden so that as a master gardener, you have to have um, uh, hours that you to keep up your certification and so it has to be on approved projects. So the Red Oak Rain Garden is an approved project of not only the master gardener program, but the East Central Illinois master naturalists. So having a community component um, with support from facilities and services, uh, which we do have, um, I, uh, I have a written MOU between extension and facilities and services. And, um, and then in adding the element that uh, of students so that at one time we can get a whole bunch of um, people 
who are young and can do a lot of work at a garden, but wouldn't maybe necessarily have the um, ability as stu students are transient. So, you know, that you, you, it's, it's, it's good to have them intermittently, but to have this steady stream of trained, knowledgeable community volunteers. As you can tell, I have thought about it a lot. So <laughs> it's probably more of an answer that you are looking for, but, um, it, the, it's, it, we really love this garden and we wanna make sure that it's cared for on into the future. Uh, Eliana, can you, can you share any like uh, uh, costing, you know, information about uh, the, the, this particular garden? I mean, I, I know it's probably maybe, you know, m most places you're not gonna have, you know, 60 tons of stone to remove uh, to begin with, but um, anything you can share about that? Yeah, that, that, um... That that did skew things a bit uh, on our on our budget. Um, well, I, the the plants themselves were um, were a typical cost of what you would expect for a rain garden. The same sort of like cost per for square foot. So I uh, it's we haven't really separated out our total costs from what a um, what a typical project would cost. But I will say that. Um, this year, one of the things that I am working on with our um, foundation development folks is setting up a, um, a maintenance endowment for the garden. And so in, in doing so, I am doing um, some, I'm tallying up our maintenance costs, things like having facilities and services come out and clean out our pipe, uh, as an example. Um, a couple of these other kinds of things that a typical garden project might not have, but uh, we are putting those forth together so that we can get a budget that would uh, be able to be matched with a donor or um, a number of donors to help us to be able to keep funding for the future. I will uh, also gonna mention that we do have a uh, in addition to private funders that we have, we received a really wonderful grant from the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation, which helped make this project possible and uh, included a um, three to one match uh, for um, community fundraising and stewardship portion of things. So that has really helped us to um, get a good handle on um, what keeping a garden like this um, looking good into the future would be like. So Chris, I gave you no dollars, but um, <laughs> more information on how we're making it happen. Uh, one other thing I will say on that, on that grant is that um, it's not only the Red Oak Rain Garden, there's some neighboring properties that we are doing some um, improvement on. Um, there's a detention pond, right? Right beyond this evergreen is a, is a detention pond that's currently in, um, it has an, uh, a, a concrete bank, but then it has a uh, Lomo around it and it's invaded by a lot of thistle. So we are converting it to a high quality prairie. Um, in fact, um, um, they, um, there will be, I think, um, 10 years, a 10 year plan of converting some of our Lomo areas on campus to high quality vegetation. So uh, this will be the first one that's done. Uh, so we have about um, 10 acres in this area that, um, that we are doing some work on improving. Very good, very interesting. Uh, and I'm sure as far as the costs go that uh, uh, being able to use the students and other volunteers, uh, I'm sure saved a ton of money uh, in, in putting this in. So that's, that's very good. We did have another question come in. Um, it's, do any animals live in the gardens such as snakes, lizards, mice? I have seen zero snakes, lizards, and mice. I have seen um, a pretty adorable but probably destructive bunny family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the cutest destroyers, right? Uh, I have seen, um, personally seen, I'm, and I, I, as a, uh, on my Saturdays and off time as a master gardener, I come out here and, and do uh, care for the garden myself. Uh, those caterpillars were uh, some of the most prolific amounts of wildlife that I've, that I've seen out here. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of birds. Um, so, but none of, I haven't seen anything that would be considered 
um, undesirable. Uh, I mean, beyond bunnies. And that's only like half undesirable, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, very good. I don't, um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, but well done. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we'll go ahead and maybe uh, end five minutes early. Um, so that's that's fine. But I uh, again, I, I do want to thank Eliana for uh, her time and sharing her knowledge and experiences with us. Uh, so thank you very much, Eliana. Very good. Well done. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for uh, for joining us, our audience for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed and learned uh, several things from the webinar this afternoon. Uh, and we will be sending out a recorded what the recorded webinar and the PDH certificate in the very near future following the program here. Uh, please keep in mind uh, that DuPage County stormwater management it will be hosting two free po uh, pollution prevention webinars. Uh, those are scheduled for later this month, April 22nd and April 29th uh, from nine until 1030. Uh, these webinars will educate government staff and contractors on methods to reduce polluted stormwater runoff. And again, one and a half PDHs will be available for each of those webinars. So uh, that's all we have. Uh, so until then, thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone.